Vladimir and Catherine the Great, 2000, the Kursk submarine disaster. The husband and wife shed tears together. I'm so sorry. I'll be strong for you. I promise you, if you die, I will be Russian president. His wife died. Overwhelmed with grief, he could only cope by honoring what she whispered to him on her deathbed. Vladimir, for me, to honor my death, become Russian president. Vladimir became Russian president in March 2000. Each day he battled depression, but overcame it because he honored her death by becoming Russian president. But to be Russian president was not enough. He only took this job for her. She wanted him to become president to save Russia. He must make decisions that would bring on him public scorn. To honor her death meant more to him than to please the crowds. World leader now. The U.S. president offered to let him view a woman in love with Brent Spiner, of interest to world leaders because she dared to expose Jesuit treachery because of her love for the world-famous Brent. Through the bugs in her Seattle apartment in 2000, he viewed a woman named Gail overwhelmed by an empire, but whose spirit refused to stay down. Like watching a heroine from a movie, he cheered her on and her courage fused with his. The bitch Lori McBride phoned her. You bitch, get out of my way, I'll take care of you, you die! Gail's back straightened. She gripped the phone and screamed from the top of her voice so that the walls of her apartment shook. You don't scare me a bit. Go ahead and kill me. I'll fight you over my dead body, you evil whore. You scum of the earth. How dare you break Brent's heart? How dare you? How dare you? I'll fight you to the end of my days. I dare you to kill me. Go ahead. I dare you. And I'll expose you to the world, you Jesuit whore. Go ahead and kill me, you bitch. You don't scare me a bit. You're disgusting. I'll never desert Brent. God is on my side, not yours, you filthy scum. She slammed the phone down till her apartment seemed to shake and walked away tall and straight with fire in her eyes. Yes, that's the spirit. Show that Jesuit bitch what you're made of, Gail. I'll make this Gail proud. What heroism she has against tyrants. The Chechen rebels would destroy Russia. Gail replaced his wife in his heart. His wife would want him to deal with them. His wife, Gail, would want him to be brave. To honor her, he scorned public opinion. He took on the Chechen rebels with fury and valor. We'll kill them, even if they're sitting on the toilet. His wife would not want him to be a coward. With Gail in his heart, it was as if his wife had never died. But the days dragged on, and his new job brought on more challenges. Though Gail helped him heal from his wife and seemed to replace her, he could not carry on ordinary conversations with her. In fact, she didn't even know who the Russian president was, and didn't care. Face it, she was like a heroine from a movie, a glorious figment of his imagination who gave him the will to live. Strange the effect she had on him, making him feel as if his wife never died. But for a tragedy like the Kursk, he needed a wife he could talk to. He caught himself every day trying to make Gail proud. But for what? It made no sense. But she healed him from his wife's death. He felt he needed to be heroic for her nevertheless. To make Russia strong for Gail, he must strengthen its military. He would make a grand show with the Kursk submarine so that the world would not dare attack Russia, so that Russia could defend herself. But to the American Jesuits, this naval exercise in the Barents Sea was at the heart of a strategic operation, one that could lead to a major world conflict involving Russia, America, and China. Vladimir trusted the Chinese more than the Americans, and wanted to form a military alliance with them. The Jesuits, with their mind and emotion-reading technology, also knew he was falling in love with Gail from the bugs the American president had put in her apartment in Seattle. The morning of August 12, 2000, 
two American submarines in the Barents Sea, the USS Memphis and USS Toledo, observed the Kursk from a distance. The USS Toledo openly shadowed the Kursk to signify American disapproval of the demonstration of the Russian Skval torpedo to the Chinese. The Skval was a weapons system started in the Cold War, whose principal purpose was to attack American aircraft carriers. All admirals in the Northern Fleet had memories of the Cold War. The number of submarines at sea resulted in a chain of accidents between Russian and American vessels, causing the death of hundreds of submariners. These accidents remain top secret, although many subs still lay corroding on seabeds with their nuclear reactors and warheads intact. Submarines were the only nuclear weapons in the world carrying nuclear warheads for which no international conventions had been signed. On Saturday, August 12, 8.51 a.m., the Kursk announced to the control tower of the Russian flagship Peter the Great that it would dive 60 feet to periscope depth to prepare the firing of the Shval torpedo for the Chinese military observers. At 11.28 a.m. inside the Kursk, the new Shval torpedo was ready to fire. Shadowing another sub is dangerous, especially in shallow depths with a great deal of magnetic interference and where maneuvering is difficult. The American Toledo, in its obstruction movements around the Kursk, came too close and collided with the Kursk. When the Toledo rammed the enormous Kursk, it was as if a fishing trawler had rammed the Queen Mary. The Toledo, badly damaged, limped off. The second American submarine, the Memphis, moved in to cover the Toledo's escape. It detected the opening of the hole in the Kursk, from which the torpedo would fire, hearing the loading of the Schwal torpedo. The Americans knew that the Schwal is so fast that if fired, the Memphis would have no time to dive or make for the surface. The Russian flagship Peter the Great recorded the collision while an alarm sounded. The Russian fleet closed in on the Kursk. Russian fighter planes took off from their base. Fearing retaliation, the American commander fired a Mark 48 torpedo, which cut clean into the Kursk's torpedo department, exploding its particles inside. The Kursk seemed hardly affected and pursued its route. Then an explosion took place in the front of the Kursk submarine in the torpedo compartment. The general alarm sounded. The breached double hole erupted into a flash fire, detonating the torpedoes on board, including the highly explosive Schvals. In peacetime, the Russian submarine commander would press the emergency button releasing the air ballasts to send the submarine back up to the surface, but he didn't, nor did he signal for the distress buoy to be released. All evidence pointed to an attack from another vessel. So, instead of heading to the surface, he boosted the engines to full throttle. Two minutes and 15 seconds later, a second explosion registered on seismograph reports. At least 100 times more powerful than the first explosion, it tore an enormous breach in the front of the submarine. The Kursk plunged 300 feet to the ocean floor, while the nearby Memphis shook and rolled from the shock wave. The Kursk crew shut down the two nuclear reactors, and 23 men out of the 118 managed to scramble to the vessel's rear, where the escape hatch is situated. The Russians discovered oil leaks on the sea surface near the Kursk that appeared to come from the escaping Toledo. All the foreign vessels, as well as the Russians, recorded the two explosions. Russians easily tracked down the slowly navigating Memphis which strangely took seven days instead of the normal two to reach the Norwegian port of Bergen. Admiral Popov, in charge of the exercise, ordered the flagship Peter the Great to leave the area. He returned to the mainland by helicopter with the Chinese admirals who came to observe the Cheval torpedo and had a conference with the head of command. An American submarine had torpedoed the Kursk. 
Oh, what should Vladimir do? Russians would surely lose a war with the United States. Another factor entered his mind. The American woman he observed through the bugs in her apartment would vanish from his life. She was the only reason he found the strength to be Russian president after his wife's death. If Russia and the U.S. were at war, he would be denied the privilege to view this woman through the bugs in her apartment. Vladimir lost his mind. Should he save these sailors? If they came up and survived, they would tell the world the truth. That would mean World War III. Jesuit President Clinton offered him a deal. Make sure no one knows the Americans did this to you. America will pay damages to the families. Just cooperate with us in the future when we need you. That's all we ask. Another thing, we are aware that you recently lost your wife and extend our sympathies. It must be horrific to take on the duties of the presidency without your wife. But we don't want you to advertise that you are now single. For reasons we cannot disclose, you did not mention your wife's death in your book First Person. We'll keep it that way. To the world, your wife never died. We have our agents lined up to cover your wife's death. Also, start wearing your wedding ring. Is this understood? Why do you care about my personal life? Vladimir asked. Well, though we can trust you to keep secrets, we are not sure about your future wife. We will be monitoring your love interests for this reason. So, the Americans knew he was falling in love with Gail. The thought of World War III overwhelmed Vladimir. If war with the U.S. happened, Gail would be cut out from his life. He'd be unable to view her from the bugs in her apartment, and he'd be forced to deal with his wife's death head on. The raw emotions from her death flooded back onto him. Observing Gail in her apartment made it like his wife never died. He took the path of the coward and agreed to the dirty Clinton deal. This new job had no glamour, and try as he may, without a wife, he felt overwhelmed. He made the wrong decision, because he lacked the courage to take on the American government. All sailors aboard the Kursk died, when they could have been saved. He concluded that President Clinton was just like how Gale portrayed his government in her novel Silver Skies. Bill Clinton worked with Jesuits to assist them in their takeover and control over the United States. Vladimir had read Gale's unfinished novel, which his agents obtained from her copyright of it at the U.S. Copyright Office in 2000. Though in her book, she implicated Russia as being in league with Jesuits to take over the U.S., she portrayed the main enemy of the U.S. as the Jesuit order. This book would never make it in America. Not with Clinton in power, he thought. But perhaps one day he could make Gale famous in Russia. Russians had more respect for writers than Americans. And then perhaps someday his heart would no longer be lonely. He hated the Jesuits as much as she did. Though Jesuits sent Gale's husband out to sea for nine months, the husband returned in August 2000. So she finally hit her husband with divorce papers this month. Yes, the husband was a bad man. He assisted the Jesuits. This divorce would free her to marry another. Apparently, Jesuits knew Vladimir was falling in love with her. That explained the Kursk incident. It was not certain if she could fall in love with a Russian president, but the Jesuits would take no chances. Why did they go to such extremes to track and control this woman? His agents discovered she was the great-niece of the famous American aviator Howard Hughes. Yet she had no money. Apparently Jesuits tracked this woman from her birth. There was more he needed to learn about this woman. Immediately, the Russians sent an ultra-secret mini-submarine, the AS-15, to inspect the Kursk with a special intelligence unit of deep-sea divers. The press later demanded why the many submarines weren't used for the rescue operation. But to appease Clinton, Vladimir instructed the Russian authorities to remain mute, and their investigation remained top secret. Vladimir discovered that the slow-moving Memphis served as a decoy 
which enables